Welcome to this webinar, Beyond 2D Eye Recordings, the importance of measuring torsion and dynamic head movements in the diagnosis and treatment of BPPV. My name is Darren Whelan. Um, I have the pleasure of opening this webinar today before handing over to my expert colleague, Dr. Michelle Petrak, to uh, examine some case studies and then summarising uh, towards the end. And then I'll be back to offer a summary towards the end. So let me just quickly recap what the objectives are for today's webinar. We're going to have a look at the benefits of using an accelerometer to detect head position during a BPPV assessment. Also then looking at the benefits of a torsional algorithm to identify the affected canal in BPPV and looking at torsional eye movements in general when we look at positioning and positional uh, assessments. And then finally, um, at the very end, we'll come back and just take a moment to look at the benefits of pairing these torsional eye movements, these 3D eye movement recordings with a repositioning chair such as the TRV chair. So whilst this webinar is not a deep dive into the pathophysiology and the fundamental properties of benign paroxysmal positioning vertigo, I think it always is nice to take a moment just to take a quick glimpse into the history of where we are at with that particular condition because it sometimes illustrates and, and highlights where we currently sit in terms of our understanding of the where technology is being incorporated into both the assessment and the treatment. So if we take a moment to step back a little bit in time, really some of the first descriptions of BPPV, certainly in the medical literature, and there are some uh, further back in literature in general, but in the medical literature are uh, attributed to Adler in 1897. But really it's Robert Barani who probably made the first descriptor of this paroxysmal element of vertigo and the cause of this being potentially uh, from the utricular system. And then we move a little bit further in time in the 20th century and we come across what now has become very familiar terminology to us in, uh, in our fields, Margaret Dix and Charles Hallpike, who, working together in Queen's Square, London, England, did really the first in-depth analysis of 100 patients who they were seeing with this condition of benign paroxysmal positioning vertigo. And they devised the provoking uh, manoeuvre, actually the La Grunze manoeuvre, as described within their literature, that then became the gold standard test for BPPV, particularly the posterior canal, um, that we now call the Dix and Hallpike test. But even then, the pathophysiology, the actual process behind how this condition was affecting the peripheral vestibular semicircular canals in particular, wasn't really fully understood. And the first uh, highlight to that was Schutnik in certainly the early 1962, but certainly by 1969, actually doing some uh, histology uh, of temporal bone uh, examinations and came with the theory of cupular lithiasis. So the, the idea that these autocornea were in the semicircular canal and were potentially resting on the cupula, making it much more uh, heavy and gravity um, sensitive. And if you like some nice reading, there's a very detailed paper by Dix and Hallpike from 1952, looking at three different groups of, of patients uh, with vestibular conditions, of which the 100 patients with BPPV are uh, described. Moving a little bit further forward into the 20th century, we really got the, the two further names that uh, join us in terms of both the assessment then and the treatment of BPPV, which was Alan Simont, a, a physical therapist, physiotherapist in France, who um, also came across a provoking and treatment uh, option for BPPV, the Simont manoeuvre and the side-lying uh, test being part of that in 1988. And then the movement in understanding some of the pathophysiology of BPPV and canal lithiasis was proposed by John Epley and certainly by the latter end of the 1980s, early 1990s, amongst a group of, of medical specialists came up with the treatment option then of the Epley manoeuvre, which we now see as being much the common uh, treatment option for posterior canal BPPV that we utilise today in clinic. So let's take a moment just then to consider 
with that information, what we're referring to when we collectively talk about BPPV, this benign paroxysmal positioning vertigo disorder. So let's take a moment and consider what we're actually referring to in terms of the process of what's happening in BPPV. So essentially what we're referring to is this condition where autocornea becomes displaced from the utricular system and makes its way into the semicircular canals. And as we've just mentioned, there are two uh, processes that we see commonly. Canalothiasis, which we think 90% of BPPV is attributed to, which is these uh, autocorneas that are being displaced and are free-floating within the end of the lymph of the semicircular canal. And cupulothiasis, which is the Schupnik theory, where the autocornea is actually adhered to the cupula itself, making it heavier and gravity-dependent. So essentially BPPV is characterized by these brief episodes of vertigo, spinning dizziness is more commonly, but it can be referred to uh, by different descriptors, induced by a change in head position. Now commonly this would be laying down or turning over in bed, but certainly we may see that by tipping our head back or tipping our head forward if we were reaching up for a something off a shelf or closing a curtain, for example. So it's the mechanical displacement of that autocornea from the utricular system, the autolith organ, into the semicircular canals that makes an angular sensor, which is what our semicircular canals are, gravity sensitive. Uh, and that's where we get this conflict within the sensory systems, providing information to the brain that doesn't correspond to the actual head or body movement that we have undertaken. So when we see BPPV in the clinic, actually what we're seeing is patients that um, frequently are uh, experiencing an unexplained uh, sensitivity to movement, uh, of which then we need to identify what might be causing that condition. And we have some great guidance and documentation that enables us to really adhere to the diagnostic criteria to separate out BPPV, thinking of this as a benign treatable condition, from other things that would be of a red flag that maybe would require different medical management and investigation. And one here that we've uh, referred to is the Barani criteria, the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo diagnostic criteria by the Barani Society, uh, published in 2015. So what m remains a challenge, uh, even looking at um, the descriptors for the diagnostic uh, criteria, is how do we locate or how do we ascertain where these autocornea have become displaced? Because as we know, the vestibular end organ and the inner ear itself is within a bony labyrinth. So therefore, it's not possible for us to access it and look at it in a way in which where we could observe what was happening at that level. We really then need to look at some of the interactions of the reflexes. And that then becomes key in terms of both diagnosing the location of the autocornea that's floating around in the semicircular, but also which process is, is occurring. Is it a cupulothiasis or is it a canalothiasis BPPV that's causing these alterations? And that's really where eye movements become key and important. As we know, when examining BPPV in a patient and using the provoking uh, assessment procedure, whether that's the Dix Hall Pike procedure or the Samont sideline procedure, it's really those eye movements and the activation of the VOR response that's giving us a location of where the rogue signaling is coming from the peripheral end organ. Now, BPPV itself is often reported as occurring spontaneously in the population, certainly as we start to become older adults, so the 50 to 70 year old group. And some of the statistics do show different levels of prevalence. And I think part of that depends on which clinic you're um, ca counting your data from, whether it's an ENT or a neurology or a primary care clinic, but also which age ranges in your data sample. But typically what we're expecting to see is that of patients that report dizziness up to uh, 30%, so certainly on average 25%, may have BPPV as part and parcel of their um, reported symptoms. And that could be an idiopathic BPPV, as we described, something that just has literally occurred spontaneously, and we think that may be from an aging utricular system, um, not uh, holding into the autocornea quite, quite as well as it would have done when it was younger. Or it could be as a secondary issue related to other vestibular lesions that's affected the peripheral end organ, where BPPV becomes a secondary uh, concern after that lesion has occurred. So what about the evidence base with BPPV? Well, 
there's a growing evidence base of the interest of looking at three-dimensional analysis of the nystagmus because typically up to this point in time when we've looked at um, BPPV and we're looking for the characteristic torsion of the eye movement created by the location of the autocornea, we're doing that under direct observation whether we've recorded that or whether we're looking at that uh, through a frenzel goggle or actually just observing the eyes, we're looking at the direction of the eye movement. If we've been under VNG goggle uh, recording, then we've got horizontal and vertical channels being represented, but up to now, not really a, a, a clinical application of being able to capture the torsional uh, element of that eye movement. And the clinical practice guidelines uh, show uh, interest into locating the uh, area of concern for BPPV by examining the eye movement and suggesting that certainly uh, moving towards video ocleography or VNG recording of eye movement is becoming much more uh, preferential in being more precise about identifying BPPV and separating it out from pseudo BPPV or non-benign BPPV. Now, for those that have um, a little bit more interest in BPPV and want to understand a, a bit of the history and the pathophysiology, office treatment and future directions, I can certainly make a recommendation of a, a paper that we have here by Dr. Jeremy Hornenbrook that gives a great overview and whets your appetite in terms of where BPPV has been developed and our understanding over time. Let's get back to the topic of today's webinar now that we've set the scene and look at eye movements. So the clinical challenge that we have, whether we're doing it under direct observation or under a frenzel goggle or under VNG, is what direction is the eye actually moving? Now we've said that in BPPV, these are generally quite short latency, uh, so quick eye movement responses, and their duration can be quite uh, short. But the patient does experience quite a violent sense of uh, dizziness. So understandably, for those of those that have done many BPPVs, the eye movements are quite short. We're dealing with quite an anxious patient often. They're feeling dizzy. They may be seeing the room moving around them and they want to close their eyes. So it's a challenge. How do we establish what the direction of the eye is moving uh, to be accurate in terms of both separating out any red flag uh, movements, but also being able to then confirm the presence of the semicircular canal so we can carry out the correct repositioning maneuver. As things stand presently, to carry out a Dick's Hole Pike, we have the patient seated. We turn their head to 45 degrees to localize the side that we want to um, investigate. So in this uh, illustration, we have the head turned a little bit to the right. We then lay them down. Now the head does need to be a little bit lower than uh, the body, so extended, somewhere between 20 to 30 degrees. So you can use the, the back of a table to do that or a cushion behind them. And then we can observe the eyes. So as we said, the, the options for uh, observing the eyes could be direct observation, a frenzel observation, so trying to take away any points where the patient could fixate or certainly to take away some of the movement that the patient might be seeing. But what we would be proposing, as we've said in the uh, guidance that's come before, is looking at the more, more direct observation. So video ocleography, VNG, video nystagmography. So being able to actually record the eyes whilst the patient is in the provoking position to both establish a objective measurement uh, which we could then go back and, and re-examine without having to retest, because those of us that are familiar with BPV knows that it can habituate as we uh, do repeated testing. And also the patient feels quite unwell if we keep testing them over and over again. So we've got a record there of uh, a video that we can review and even consult with our uh, colleagues and obviously document uh, what the severity is. So that's really covered up. So that's really brought us up to having a 2D recording of the eye, both in the vertical and the horizontal plane, but so far we haven't touched on the 3D element, the torsion. And that's where the movement towards an advanced Dick's Hall Pike uh, comes into play. So when we're talking about advanced Dick's Hall Pike, the first element that creates that being a little bit more advanced is the application of a 3D head model. So what you can see here is the model within the VNG software of the orientation of the head relative to the position on the body and the semicircular canals. Now that allows us to very precisely position the head both into the testing and provoking conditions so we can correlate the localized uh, semicircular canal that you can see here, Dixall Pike to the right, head extended, 
And so we've got the position to the right, we've got the other bar telling us that the position of the head is down. And we're getting a visual representation that the head is in the correct position for the test so we can have a look at the eye movement. The next thing to facilitate that head model is um, obviously the VNG software needs to know where the head is in position. So that is in the incorporation of an accelerometer uh, on top of the VNG goggle to precisely orientate uh, the calibrated system so that we get effective feedback through the model to make sure we're in the exact position to have the maximum stimulation for the identified semicircular canal. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So at the very top screen here, you can see the right and left eye being represented with almost what looks like a crosshair. We can see the model in a little bit more detail now. We've moved the head to the right. We've led the patient down there into the down position, head extended, the model's indicating that. And then we can see that characteristic eye movement being represented. So we've got objective recording of the torsional velocity on the bottom right, but also the position of the, uh, in the horizontal plane as well. So we've got right to left, clockwise and counterclockwise being represented. Now looking at the torsion tracking itself, we can see there's a lot of detail uh, in here looking at both the horizontal, the vertical eye movements and that torsional eye movement. And again, if we look, you can see in the time base as the recordings are being generated, we're able to quantify those and measure them in degrees per second of movement. Now, this gives us a very good, clear, objective measurement of that eye behavior and also allows us to separate out um, just pure torsional nystagmus from nystagmus that also is being influenced by in the up uh, or down position as well. Having the ability to record in 3D not only allows us to objectively measure those eye movements in the clockwise and counterclockwise direction and have a hard recording so we can review that with our peers, gives us so much more data when looking at eye behavior, both in the provoking conditions, but also then as we move through the repositioning, we can almost can track how the behavior of the eye is being influenced by the autocornea moving through the semicircular canal. But it also lends us a little bit more information. Um, we've alluded a little bit in this initial introduction towards the separation of benign paroxysmal positioning vertigo from pseudo BPPV, so non benign conditions that may have torsion, so central conditions. And again, it's at this point that it gives me great pleasure to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Michelle Petrek, with her expertise in examining some cases to present to you how the data may look different depending on what is the provoking pathology.